welcome everybody the society 2045 friday talks uh, their interviews with people worldwide who are seeking to create a better future through social movements and thought leadership. Uh, we aim to bring together social movements from across various disciplines to help co-create a broader and more cohesive vision for the year 2045. We have a collective vision of what it might be like, but we want to add yours. We can create a more robust voice for change by bringing together adjacent movements and thought leaders. And one of those thought leaders is with us here today, and that is Christine. And I think I say your name, McDougal. Is that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah, so yeah. I, I met Christine a long time ago, um, spent a, uh, a night or two at her house uh, Sorry, on I the Gold Coast. Uh, she was up to cool things when I met her some 10 years ago and is up to even cooler things now. So Christine, you can tell everybody what you're up to. Yeah. We'll have some questions, some mm -hmm. of which are standard questions and some of which are just conversation. So welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I, uh, well, actually, I, I'll start, I will start on some sort of linear time scale. In my, in my mid twenties, I was introduced to the work of Buckminster Fuller. And, uh, I think the thing that captivated me most about his work in the early days was the example he set because integrity is kind of the thread of my entire life. And so the example he set at the age of 32 uh, was attempting suicide, feeling that he was a failed business person and a, a terrible father. Um, his uh, first child had died. He dedicated his life to serving the highest good for the highest number of people without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. And he set out a set of self-disciplines to demonstrate that when we did this, when we were when humans are spontaneously arousable uh, to act for the highest good, uh, that our needs would be taken care of. And he wanted to demonstrate that possibility. And so I think that was the thing that captivated me the most in my 20s. When I say that I'm influenced by his work, I mean that superficially. I had the good fortune of spending seven days doing a, an incredible deep dive, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, with uh, Amy Edmondson, who's a Harvard professor now, who was his protege for the last three years of his life, and the author of my most favorite book, <laughs> which is a fuller explanation, which is a book for nerds. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so... Uh, and other people, and we were building models and really exploring his thinking. And so I have used, I have been influenced by him more than any other person in my life, because very early on, I started off with a medical science degree. I knew that that was too confining for me um, because I have a more whole systems perspective. And so I was, I was part of the early, and I mean early, early coaching movement, obviously, that happened out of the United States. You will all laugh at this because uh, this is back in the 90s when uh, in Australia there was five people I knew who were calling themselves coaches that weren't sports inclined. So, you know, <laughs> that seems peculiar today, but there you go. Uh, and I'm back in the 90s, I went to a coaching conference in Phoenix, Arizona. It's called the International Coach Federation. <laughs> and uh, a little upstart Aussie landed in this coaching conference. And I went up to John Seifer, who was the president at the time, and I said, I can't see any internationals. So what the hell are you calling yourself the International Coach Federation for? <laughs> And as a result of that, I got invited to be the first non-American on the board of the International Coach Federation and, uh, and set up the whole chapter system worldwide and everything else like that, um, started coaching in Australia, which got me into the corporate arena. And it wasn't, it was accidentally, inadvertently, not by design in banking and finance. So none of that was strategic. It was completely happenstance. What I did with Bucky's work was I was applying it to human relational geometry, so human synergistics. Bucky spent most of his time applying it to uh, the built environment, and uh, so he's very well known for the geodesic dome, but he was designing cars and houses and cities and communities that were completely off and using the minimum amount of materials and et cetera, et cetera, and he was doing that back in the 1930s, so kind of well and truly ahead of his time. 
He also, in the 1927, he wanted to determine the all-in accounting cost of a barrel of oil. All-in accounting meaning that he wanted to include in that radical thinking uh, how much it cost Earth to produce the oil, and then the post-use cost. And he determined in 1927 that uh, there wasn't a single human on the planet that could afford a single barrel of oil, and that eventually we would pay the after-tax of our lack of accounting. <laughs> Um, and so, quite frankly, if we did an all-in accounting of cost of most businesses, there wouldn't be business if we use the current metrics of profit, et cetera, et cetera. So this type of radical thinking captivated me, but I was applying it to human relationships. And so my exploration has been around how do we bring people together to create stuff that matters for a world with a future? And that's really been my life thread. Uh, and of course, you don't know your life thread until you can look back and see it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I kissed a lot of career frogs <laughs> and I uh, tried a lot of things, uh, but my life thread has been that. And over the course of 30 years, convened amazing, good, wholehearted people around ideas and had it fall into a messy human heap. And of course, if we want to uh, create a world that works for everybody, then messy human heaps aren't the optimal uh, ground from which to work from. And so uh, whatever I was doing wasn't working. <laughs> and, uh, and then in 2015, a health event in local city, it's about half a million communities stretched over a long, long strip, kind of like Miami, with very beach based, better beaches by far, but <laughs> surfing beaches and so on, but uh, kind of like Miami um, and long, long uh, beach, very narrow, sort of hugging the beach community. I held a local event um, called Big Blue Sky, and the purpose of this was to bring together multi-stakeholders of my city to co-create the future of the city and become innovative in the thinking about how we could, you know, do things go completely off-grid, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and it was a phenomenal event. It was the first time I'd done anything like that. It was the first time I'd worked with three levels of government, so federal, state, and local government. Uh, the first time I'd been in a public sphere, working at the, the public sort of in public domain, uh, which came with its challenges. But uh, the thing that happened that was the what Bucky would say was the processional effect of Big Blue Sky. So the side effect uh, was that I it was a very inspired. Uh, enterprise that we created and one of the things that Bucky you would appreciate this Kim one of the things that Bucky always challenged he challenged everything from legal codes to currency mechanisms and so on and so forth and so I was determined not to have big sky be in a traditional legal sense but what could we do and so we created it under the banner of a trust uh, obviously each jurisdiction has different law but we created under the banner of trust and I wrote this thing <laughs> which was very inspired piece of writing, um, which is called the Trust Manifesto. And we managed to get it encoded in the trust. And the Trust Manifesto uh, is kind of like a, an enterprise agreement. Uh, and it had a couple of really critical pieces in there. Number one, anyone who wanted to participate in the creation of Big Blue Sky had to agree to this trust as a way of behavior, behavior with each other. And number two, we had this um, tool called the synergistic audit that everyone who wanted to participate had to complete. And the synergistic audit is a, a nominated, so uh, sovereign choice named what you have the capacity, willingness and desire to bring to this initiative, in this case, Big Blue Sky, in six domains of value. And for that bringing, what do you expect in return in the same six domains of value? We had 12 complete strangers from incredibly diverse backgrounds. No HR department in any company would ever con consider putting these people together to create an event. No one with event experience, no one with global event experience, <laughs> no one with uh, um, multi-stakeholder working with government experience, all of that. So, you know, we were all completely naive dare to be naive, says Bucky. And, uh, and uh, 
but what happened as a result of this enterprise architecture and the activity of doing the synergistic counting was a group of 12 complete created a world-class event with something like 60 moving parts and uh, there wasn't a single human upset and it was entirely self-managed. It was kind of like watching, if you can imagine, it was kind of like watching if you were out in a large city and there were a bunch of musicians wandering around complete strangers and then they decided to sit down and play a piece of music, it was kind of like watching that. To sort of complete this cycle, at the end that we did Big, Big Blue Sky two years in a row, as I said, it was my first public facing role. Uh, we were very future based, future thinking. We challenged a lot of the traditional thinking and so on and so forth. So one of the large Australian institutions that puts themselves out as being a center for innovative excellence was extraordinarily threatened by what we were doing and pretty much brought us to our knees. I couldn't understand how something that was created by, uh, with so much love and care for a future that had so little ego involved in it could be so maliciously attacked. And I took it personally which was a mistake. <laughs> I took it personally uh, and it had me uh, go through my own dark night of the soul existential crisis pretty much. Yeah, it was big. And, but the, the short story of that is that when I chose to re-engage, my choice was really clear that I was going to spend the rest of my life uh, no longer trying to fix the broken, I say no longer trying to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic or polish the guardrails. Um, <laughs> rather build new boats that make the existing obsolete, which is a Bucky um, adapting from one of his famous quotes. Uh, and so to take a 90 degree turn and really focus on what was possible. And so out of that was born Centropic World. And Centropic, of course, is a term coined by Bucky Fuller to be the opposite of entropy, entropy being the second law of thermodynamics, meaning that we're in a, in a degenerative wearing down universe. Bucky always said and demonstrated mathematically that we're in a centropic or eternally regenerative universe. And so a centropic enterprise is, is, leaves everything better. Enterprise, I'm really particular with my words. Again, this is Bucky training. Enterprise is any human endeavor. So whether it's a family, a community, a legal, legally structured group of people, a partnership, a business, a large business, a not-for-profit, anyone coming together on any form is an enterprise. And of course, if we're going to do anything, we work together. So how do we do that? How do we do that in a way that sets the precedent for the future of human enterprise that enables ecologies of synergy where collectively we are far better than we are individually and uh, demonstrate that we can rethink and recreate pretty much the way we do everything together as humans, applying the laws of nature to everything that we do. And so Centropic World was born out of that. And we now have a global community in 25 countries <laughs> And, uh, and you know, my commitment is to have centropic enterprises become a, a common occurrence. Uh, and so we, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in grassroots activism. I'm a huge believer in ground swell. I'm a, human, a huge believer in the individual humans collectively working and creating. And so our aim is to create as many centropic enterprises as possible and have that expand around the world. This is a huge vision. It's gonna go beyond my lifetime. We're building it for that. And, uh, and to have, uh, as Bucky would say, argue with the model, have the models and the demonstration and the stories and the outcomes and so on, uh, tell the story and create the gravitational attraction that creates more impetus, more synergy, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of the... <laughs> Uh, short version, three years of where we are now. Uh, COVID was great for us because it took us from being live in person. So um, you mentioned six domains of value. Can you go back yeah. and, and talk about those? Yeah, uh, the model that we use for that, uh, is anyone deeply familiar with Bucky's work? Um, so uh, 
so really what he was doing, and I'm coming back to his work because it's important, really what he was doing was he, want, he wanted to understand the working laws of universe, how things work. If I release my fingers, there's no delusion about what will happen. We're not going to have a glass of water go up. <laughs> we know what will happen if I release my fingers. So the law of gravity, of course, is 100% all of the time on everything for everyone anywhere, anything on earth. Um, I don't like it sometimes when I see what it's doing to my face, but you know, there it is. But we don't think of applying the laws that we live in, breathe in. We don't think of applying those to everything that we do. And which is just, just a startling, when you really think about that, a startling in indication of our hubris <laughs> and separation from nature and natural systems and natural design. Uh, <laughs> and so we built the synergistic accounting model on, this, on the 12 degrees of freedom, which is uh, one of the laws. <laughs> uh, and so in order to stabilize any, anything in space, to keep it stable, you need to have 12, um, six positive and six negative. Um, just think of a hub of a wheel, like a bike wheel before they became carbonated or special fiber. So that you have the hub and the spokes and you need to have six on the top and six on the bottom to stabilize the hub, to stop it from spinning, twisting, moving this way, to keep it stable in motion. Geometry, of course, is the study of relationships. And so if we're going to do anything, we need relationships to work. But we never think about applying geometry to how we coordinate humans. Again, you know, our hubris, that it's just this magical thing that happens. Um, <laughs> so this is, um, this is the uh, vector equilibrium or, or icosahedron. And it's the only structure that if you put a center in here, a, a point in here at the center, uh, that it would have the, the six positive and six negative. So 12 in total vectors going to each point here, but it's like a breathing model and it'll go right down to an octahedron if I can get it right to behave itself today, it go right down to an octahedron and then it'll go right down to a tetrahedron, um, you know, um, through its movement. So that six is important. And I want to anchor that because there are a lot of people that are looking at different models of accounting for value. And there's various numbers that come up like eight, you know, you hear um, different, different versions of uh, capital, you know, for example, eight capitals or whatever. So I'm very specific about the number because of that, because we're actually doing, we're, we're, we're marrying, matching it, it's isomorphic to nature laws. So six. So we have six inputs and six outputs. And we use the 12 degrees of freedom as the, as the background frame for that. I draw this. So first of all, there's matter. Matter, which is, of course, atoms, <laughs> stuff. And then there is currency. And cur currency, of course, can be money. It can be debt. It can, it can be like, anything that flows. It can be, uh, it can be tokens, um, you know, those type of things. So credit, et cetera, et cetera. So currency. Uh, then we have knowledge. And knowledge is nothing unless you apply it. <laughs> so if you've got a whole ton of knowledge in your head and you're not actually putting it into the world, it's useless. It has no utility value. Um, and so knowledge needs to be um, uh, applied knowledge. Uh, then we have uh, tools and artifacts. And so tools and artifacts can be, uh, it can be, things like the, the facilitation tool, which is you can't, you, you might be able to draw it or whatever else like that, but it, it, in, it, in its delivery, it is an immeasurable weightless. We have tools and artifacts, and then we have um, warm data. Warm data, of course, is the beautiful term coined by Nora Bateson. If um, anyone's familiar with, anyone familiar with Nora's warm data work? Yep. So warm data is uh, everything that occurs between the spaces of relationship. 
So if uh, Kim and I were in a really robust, passionate conversation about something that we both cared about, all of that material, which of course, again, is weightless, immeasurable, invisible, all of the emotion and the passion and the vitality and the aliveness and the, there might be frustration, all of that is warm data. So it's in our data collection, it is something that is completely and absolutely ignored in most cases, yet it's the thing that makes us most human. Uh, and so there's the warm data and then there's wealth, wealth and well-being and in actual fact, the etymological root of wealth is well-being. So I'm not talking about wealth in the way that we might hold it from a, a financial point of view. I'm talking about it in the way that Bucky coined it, which is the number of days forward we can sustain life for the X number of people. And so wealth and well-being. And so this is, this is there is the... Uh, and I'm going to use the word positive and negative to this. So when, when we ask the question in the synergistic audit, it's, and it's a very clear and very explicit question, what do you have the capacity, willingness, and desire to bring to this project? This is a mutable document. It's a mutable record because in the next hour, who knows what's going to happen? And we're creating space for life and humanity, not stasis and that everything is perfect in an hour. So, for example, when we did Big Blue Sky, Lou, my co-founder, um, one day she rang me and said, um, my daughter's in emergency, I'm out. And because of the way that we structured the enterprise, she only needed to ring me and let me know the, that bringing the enterprise adapted to her not being available and gave the space and the grace. She was out, no question, no question. But we had within the design of how we convened and cohered as a group of people, the adaptability for that to just be an exhale and an inhale. And so, uh, so this is a mutable record what do you have the capacity, willingness, and desire to bring to this project or this enterprise or this family or this community in these six domains? And then for that, for bringing that, what do you expect in return in these same six domains? And what happens when we have this conversation well, is several things. It's like layers of an onion. So <laughs> has anyone ever had, um, has anyone had any difficulty naming the value that you have? Naming it out loud or the value that you have to bring. Anyone have any difficulty naming the value that you have to bring out loud to somebody else? Anyone had that issue? You haven't had that issue of I'm, I, I'm valuable in this way. I have this knowledge. I'm, you know, it makes me valuable. This is my value. No one's had that issue. <laughs> Me, it's an ever-evolving inquiry. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and often situational. Yes. Right. Yeah. So a lot It did take 64 years. So I'm not suggesting, I'm not I, suggesting I, it was easy. I'm just saying I, I, I did get that, there. I was yeah. about to say, we're an older demographic yeah. and we've spent some time thinking about this. <laughs> well, anyway, quite a few people have a, have a difficulty naming their value. And so, uh, and then on the other side of that, quite a few people have a difficulty asking for what they think they should be receiving for that value contribution. And so in the very act of completing the, the audit is a confrontation with our own self because everything that we do in Centropic is an interior and exterior developmental piece as well. So it's a confrontation with your own self. And because of the container that we've created in the Trust Manifesto, um, one of the other tools that we use is clean communication, which is really powerful. But because of that container, uh, that means that just by nature of putting this out there, a lot of people go through their own sort of like excavation. Um, I had one person spent eight hours trying to fill out this audit 
And <laughs> it was so painful for him to do that. But I don't, I don't apologize for that because if we're doing important work, we, we're coming together and people are giving their time, life force, energy and love, whether they're being paid or not, it's irrelevant, towards something that you care about. We've, we've talked in the traditional business world about skin in the game, like putting money, money down. Well, skin in the game also means that we're going to do a little bit of heavy lifting to get in the door. And I'm okay with that. I'm really okay with that. Because when it's just super easy to become a, a, a part of a something, a lot of times that comes with a side effect or a processional effect of lack of responsibility, lack of really taking this seriously, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, the other thing that happens in this is because if you're working with a team and we kind of keep team numbers at 12 for reasons I just described <laughs> um, as the sort of maximum for a team before we then multiply by dividing, which is another principle of universe. But if you keep, um, then everyone in your team has access to reading your audit. Because we need to be transparent. <laughs> but there, there are so many layers to what this does because it surfaces, particularly in a team environment, it surfaces skills that we have in abundance and skills we might need. It surfaces things that we have in abundance, things we don't have. It, it, so if we go back to this, um, you know, if we go back to this and we did, we did, the, we did the, uh, the visual representation of this, you could see that if you had, like, if you didn't have any money in the, in the, in the um, enterprise, that the shape of this would actually change. Because this bit here, say in a team of 12, wasn't there to hold the shape of what we're doing. And so this is, it, it's a, it has a mapping reference to uh, the things that we have in abundance and the things that we have in abundant scarcity within this team of people. The other thing that happens with this is when, when people share this uh, with each other, uh, we've had, um, we have a, a synergistic accounting class and, and the experience of that is that you fill out your synergistic audit and you get to show up um, you choose which week you're going to do it and you get to show up and go through your order out loud with other people. And I can tell you that that is one of the most incredible team transformation things that in all of my years of working in corporate, when, in uh, human coaching and stuff like that, has been one of the most powerful things. Because when people start speaking into this, I, it, it just, it makes the relational connection the covalent bonds of humanity so far, so much stronger um, than you could imagine. So they're the, they're the uh, and then as the enterprise, this is how we do our um, audit. So we speak, um, and I did one for Centropic World at the end of last year, I'll do another one. We go through these, these dimensions uh, and so kind of like the company statement, I guess, <laughs> um, but we go through these dimensions uh, on both sides. So this is what we, this is what came in and this is what has gone out. This is, you know, this is what we've brought. This is what has been received. We go through that in both sides and as a public record as well. And that was one of the features that we built into Big Sky, to the little truck, was this was our public record. Yeah, so I don't know. I could I could speak about this as a, a two day workshop in here, but <laughs> so. I'm going to open yeah. it up to questions uh, uh, from the group. There there's some questions that are uh, questions we ask everyone, but I think you've mostly answered them. Um, and and if anybody wants to ask any of our standard questions to get Christine to say more, then feel free. But we're going to run out of time for questions if we if we go through them all individually. Thank you for sharing this model for bringing people together through an analytical lens that's so different from the way people come together to create enterprises today. 
just as an aside, I have something called um, agreements for results, which has a level of, of similarity. Can you give me some examples of the kind of enterprises that have been formed um, as a result of this? That's one question. And the second question is, so if the world operated in a synotropic way in 2045, how would, how would, it, how would the world be different? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the first, the answer to your first question about different type of enterprises, we have, um, so we have a, a, a enterprise out of the United States actually um, called Planetary Care, and that uh, they've been working with this material and incorporating it in pretty, pretty much everything that they do. Um, so it's a, it's still a startup, but they're a regenerative agriculture company that is trying to bring together. Um, trying to become, a, I guess, a base for uh, regenerative agricultural knowledge and, and so on. Um, so that, there's that. We have a, a, a couple of companies coming out of Tanzania, which is, um, so one is, uh, started off as reforesting Kilimanjaro, but it's got a lot to do with the ecological restoration of um, lands in, in Tanzania. Uh, and and community community development around that. Uh, we have uh, obviously a lot of individuals that are working with teams uh, using this material as well. Uh, we have another regenerative ag company in Australia that is. Uh, we have a lot of regenerative ag people come to Centropic, <laughs> but we have um, a company in Australia that is bringing together coaches to work with farmers directly on the land uh, around uh, the chain practice from current farming practice to regenerative agriculture. Uh, we have another farm group that is doing soil and uh, community education. Centropic World, of course, is an exemplar of how we're doing this and we are building out the synergistic accounting tool as a separate enterprise as well. So there's some that I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, I am, just to be clear, the model of Centropy is, and what we're working on now is getting, is taking time to get the foundations right uh, and really bringing this into, so we're not in a rush at the moment. That might sound contrary to what is needed, but, uh, if you, if you really understand the principle of synergy, it's really okay to take the time to do this right at the front now, end. The, the other question in 2045, you asked about if we were in a centropic universe, what would we do? Uh, well, first of all, there would be a collective agreement that hum humans are, are here to support the increased well-being of Earth and all her creatures, and that we don't have to exploit or extract to extinction or colonize to increase the well-being. Our purpose is clear that that's why we're here. And how we would be doing that is that we would be stepping off our um, hubris and arrogance as humans uh, and uh, remembering that we are actually nature, not separate from it, and that the infinite wisdom of nature uh, that is tried and tested over billions of years, way beyond the capacity of us humans, <laughs> has figured out how to coordinate collaborate, create beauty, create longevity, create heritage. And we would be representing that in everything that we do. So th thank you, Christine. One, <clears throat> one follow-up question. You mentioned a, a synotropic accounting system that you were working. Uh, at which, sorry? I, I think I heard you say you mentioned that you were working on a synotropic accounting system. Synergistic, this one, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So how? Yeah. Can you give me some idea of how that worked? What? How that worked? <laughs> and, well, and I'm just I've just shared with you this high end. This is you know it's really uh, it's a it's a it's it's this is kind of like getting you to um, showing you uh, showing you the Grand Canyon through photographs. <laughs> <laughs> I have been there, so I know that the photographs are nice, but the experience is where you kind of like take a gasp. Yeah. And, right. and, and so this is this is the synergistic accounting tool. Um, there's so much more behind this. And so where we've got, um, I'm fortunate now, uh, we've attracted a world-class um, ex big business CTO who's a centropic um, who loves this work and so we're we're really exploring how we can use the most advanced technology um, web3 etc cetera, etc cetera, to to build out this platform on the synergistic accounting uh, that enables it to become a tool that people can use with ease at the moment we're doing it in a very warm data human to human, which is great and fantastic um, uh, way, but how do we do that? And built within this as well, there's a whole mechanism for provisioning, uh, which is a huge piece in Centropic world. We've got to get away from the capital, capital accumulation, capitalism um, and, uh, and venture capital and so on and so forth. And so there's a whole mechanism that lives behind this for provisioning. There is entire possibility of removing the need to have, because part of this, of course, is that in our current world, one element of this, one element of this has power over everything else. And of course, you know, nature doesn't do monoculture. Uh, and so we live in a world where money has, has the denominational power of value over everything else. And in the accounting metric, anyone who has fallen in love and had their heart broken or been present to the birth of a child uh, knows that to, to bring some of our human experiences to, into a dollar value to commodify it is a debasement of humanity. And so until we start to recognize and honor value in multiple domains and not consistently and habitually reduce those domains to a dollar value to commodify it, then nothing we do is going to restore uh, and honor the multiple uh, values that we have in the world and so as i said you know i'm just i'm giving it a taste of something that is has complexity and depth behind it that you know you're not going to get from this little thing <laughs> of course and, and and i i, I have to ask a, another follow-up but yeah. i think i'm asking i think i'm asking questions that everybody here would ask because one of the one of the things that, that we are always seem to be pushing it up against is the way we're all wired to view things mm -hmm. through a traditional capitalist mentality, okay? Mm -hmm. Of profit and loss in a traditional sense. That being said, do you have some sense of, of how this conversion is gonna happen at a large scale? <laughs> um, and so this is, yeah. And so the, the good part of this, and this is, cause this has been thinking over 35 years or something. It's a life work thinking behind this. And remembering that I spent most of my life, um, I would say now, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic after the iceberg had been hit and hoping for a different outcome. And, uh, and you know, my existential crisis said, you know, that's not the way to do it. So, and this is again, coming back to Bucky's example that we need to build the models. And so what we're doing in Centropic World is by stealth. I'm not interested in a big, bold, you know, launch, none of that, because we're doing it by stealth. And this is the foundational thing, getting the material and the work and the use cases and the smaller businesses and so on, getting those things happening and thriving and alive. 
because as you know, when we have, when we increase the number of those that are working and we increase, you know, whether it's the white paper or whatever the traditional mechanism is, when we do that and we do that and we increase, this is actually the law of gravity. <laughs> Um, to, you know, when we increase the mass, the metaphysical mass and the number and so on, the gravitational attraction increases. So, so this is slow, steady to go fast. And it, and it is uh, what I know for sure. And I know this because for most of my life, I worked in being corporate with within the, and in banking and finance within the models. And I, most of the, most of the men that I came across the executive level are incredibly wonderful human beings in that narrative, but they know they're in the narrative, not all of them. They know they are, they know they are. And so there's this sunk cost of how to untangle from that. I believe that the best way to do that is, as I said, uh, it's the imaginal self story from the from the, the 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 disintegration of the caterpillar and the butterfly. You heard the imaginal cells where it falls into an undifferentiated heap, and then you get a couple of imaginal cells, and the undifferentiated heap goes munch. I don't like those, but they keep coming and they keep coming and they keep coming until there is enough of the imaginal cells that transformation happens. So. It's a, it's, a, it's a brick by brick, heart by heart build. Yeah, that demonstrates, demonstrates that when people like us do things like this, this is what happens. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm a complete and absolute idealist, but I'm also very practical. <laughs> You're also very committed. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to lose nothing to lose that was the existential crisis <laughs> when there's when you're when you're right down there it's like choose life choose roll over and go to sleep you know nothing to lose no doubt everyone on this call has had an existential crisis yeah. <laughs> nothing to lose then you know? <laughs> I, I, I kind of want to pick up on something Stuart said and this is one of the sort of our standard questions what are the obstacles that you see in the way of what you're trying to create oh only gazillions and billions of cash and power and uh and uh and already existing um uh, uh architecture and investment and and uh, all of that sort of stuff <laughs> Just a little bit of stuff like that. <laughs> the good news is, the good news as, and it's tragic at the same time, the tragic good news is that anyone who thinks that that's going to be the same sort of thing's going to be around in 50 or 100 years is um, probably the one that needs to be uh, considered unstable. We're not going back to normal. What's normal? <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I I I agree with that. But there are lots of people who are you know waiting for normal to return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the obstacles, um, but you, you know, and this is this is the, this is something Bucky actually demonstrated mathematically that syntropy is the greater force than entropy. But we're not told that. We're not taught that. We're not taught that just as we're not taught that the uh, minimum system in universe is the tetrahedron and that that we're built a system based on cubing versus tetrahedroning. <laughs> That's another conversation, but um, we're not taught that. So we're not taught, uh, <laughs> you know, we're under so many delusions and illusions, but the, the syntropy is the greater force. And I think most of us who have been around as long as you guys have been around know this because you know that it's the it's the archetypal battle of like good and evil. <laughs> um, know that that the light kind of happens more in the end. <laughs> and the arc of humanity is messy <laughs> and shitty. <laughs> 
and terrible and destructive and bloody and yeah and yet we pick ourselves up and we keep moving and inside most humans i've met there are a few psychopaths and sociopaths but most humans i've met have decency and love and would just really like to do live in a world where they can express themselves and experience love and care and uh and you know most so that you know that's the that's the that's the positive to this and that's the greater force in my opinion obviously <laughs> Yeah. Otherwise, I, have, I think I would have stayed in bed. <laughs> I, I, have, I, have, I have an inversion on that, which is um, it just takes massively more energy to sustain fear and hatred and anger yeah. than it does to sustain love. Mm -hmm. So there are vastly more people centered in or attracted and pulled to love than there are people centered in fear and hatred. Yeah. And in the short term, the minority, you know, dark side can, can have a powerful effect of the moment, mm. but it's a lot less sustainable mm. in the long run than uh, the vast majority um, mm. who uh, find connection and, and common bond. So yeah. I, I'm an optimist based on that. I think in the long run, you know, the light wins. Um, question is whether, you know, we we don't screw the pooch in the, along the way in, in a dramatic enough fashion to, you know, yeah. produce an extinction and planet will reset itself and start the process all over again. <laughs> Well, that, and that's what you just said there is exactly Bucky's model. You know, syntropy is the greater force to entropy. Syntropy, leaving everything better towards an eternally regenerative universe. Yeah, light is syntropic, as is a smile, as is love. The more you give, the more there is. Hmm. Well, that might be a lovely place to stop unless somebody <laughs> has another question. <laughs> Well, thank you, Christine. Thank you for <laughs> Friday morning at 10 o'clock in a different time zone. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> oh, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You have come to the right place. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you go back to the website and you look at some of the people who um, have also been speakers here, I think that you will find that there is a thread that runs through all of these conversations and that, that this is your tribe, whether we usually operate in your time zone or not. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, um, if anyone's interested, I do write, a, it's a huge production, it takes two days of work, but I do write an article every week on Sunday, which should be put out on Sundays called Sunday Syntropy. And um, the one that I've done this week is uh, the principle of exchange. So it's kind of got these pieces threaded through. Uh, but anyway, um, it's been a pleasure and thank you very much. Um, lovely to meet you all. Uh, we watch in perplexed confusion, the movements of the United States. <laughs> so do we. <laughs> Can relate you know, we to that. that. We hear that the powers of your legal people have just said, more guns, please. Yay. <laughs> and New York City on the subway. <laughs> I know. Wow. <laughs> so um, anyway, not that Australia is blame free for a lot of things, but... <laughs> We've just had a reversal of politics and it is so good to have humanity back in the room. <gasps> yep. And women. Well, maybe Australia will take over the US after everybody shoots each other. <laughs> well, you know, I, that's, you know yeah. 
we don't want it. We're not a distance. <laughs> we're, we're not take over a kind of peoples. In actual fact, my partner and I had this conversation this morning. We're going because our biggest trading partner is China, and of course, there's all that conflict and and uh, hustle bustle with China. And my partner and I had this conversation this morning about. China, you know, why is Australia affiliated with the United States? I mean, they're freaking mad. They like shooting each other. They do this, they do that, they do this, they do that. China must be looking at all of this and going, the United States, they don't produce anything anymore. They don't, they kill each other. They're all on drugs. They don't care of their poor people. You know, going, why is the West so enamored with this country? <laughs> why are we affiliated with the United States? <laughs> Well, you know, democracy, ha. Huh? It's certainly a country <laughs> enamored with itself. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have to contextualize. I have been there over 50 times. So, um, <laughs> and I always find the people amazing. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye-bye.